Thank you so much, Professor Lin. I'm really excited to present my work to you all today on a novel in-ground heat exchanger. So the first issue that I looked into with this research was the 300 off-grid communities in Canada. These communities are not connected to traditional utility lines, so they rely on diesel generation for their electricity. While we live in a cold climate, the heating sources uh, for these communities are predominantly aged and unreliable emitting sources. As well, because of the the transportation of this fuel, the costs uh, for electricity in these areas are up to nine times greater than the average Toronto resident. So there is a real energy need in these communities. The communities are shown here um, as dots on this map, and they are predominantly Métis, Innu, and First Nations and Inuit groups. As well, these communities are mostly built on permafrost regions. This is shown in blue. So what happens with climate change in these areas? We've measured in the Northwest Territories an increase in ambient air temperature of two degrees over time. This has led to a warming of the ground. So here, this is zero, which is the ground surface, and this is going down below the ground on this axis. Here we can see the change in temperature, and this is increasing in temperature due to the ambient air temperature increases. With permafrost, which is a region of soil at or below zero degrees Celsius, this can mean that this area of permafrost will be melted. Unfortunately, it's predicted that this climate change will continue. So here, the ambient air temperature is predicted in this area to increase again by two degrees over 40 years. And this will lead to a loss of half of the total permafrost area in Canada over the same amount of time. So these communities not only face an energy crisis, they also have an issue with the climate change. Looking at this graph again, most of these communities are also at places where the permafrost has a high response to warming. So shown here in orange and red, these locations are most likely to melt first if there are changes to the ambient air temperature. When this permafrost melts, we experience sinking known as thermal cars, and this also leads to the destruction of forests, significant flooding and groundwater changes, the release of toxic gas, as well as um, a high building cost. So many of these buildings are having to be rebuilt in areas where the permafrost has begun to melt. So the challenge is twofold. First, to provide sustainable energy to these communities, mainly the thermal energy, the heating of their buildings, and also to mitigate the thawing of permafrost on which these buildings are built. I undertook this challenge using geo-exchange technology. So a ground source heat pump, which is the geo-exchange technology I'm speaking of here, is a passive heat exchanger with the soil here. So it uses a nearly constant ground temperature to draw heat out in the winter through the heat pump and into the building to heat a building. In the summer, this system can be reversed to draw heat from the building and back and release it into the ground. These systems are highly efficient and can produce many times the amount of energy that they require. They last a long period of time with very little maintenance, and they most importantly can produce thermal energy without the need for combustion or emitting sources or fuel. While there is an increase in electrical use to power the ground source heat pump, this is used more efficiently through the heat pump than other means of thermal energy. Unfortunately, these systems are currently limited um, based on their ground heat exchanger component, which is this component here. At the moment, it is uh, a high capital cost to install, and the drilling requirements limit the locations where these systems can be implemented. So investigating this further, with helical steel piles, which are existing in-ground equipment used in, in some northern communities to structurally anchor a building in the ground. These are essentially hollow steel piles, uh, which can be screwed in. With Anovia Geocore, our industry partner, we're looking at using those piles uh, to replace the conventional in-ground heat exchangers. So here is a conventional borehole, which is hundreds of feet deep, 
And here is this novel pile um, heat exchanger, which is much shallower and easier to install. As well, it's possible that this pile could provide two functions at once, being both the structural anchor and the heat exchanger. So this would reduce the original cost. The means by which this pile exchanges heat is primarily through convection of the fluid flow and conduction through the solid materials and the soil. We designed these systems so that the amount of heat that they extract in the summer, shown as this peak in temperature here, is approximately equal to the amount of heat that they, sorry, the amount of heat that they put into the soil in the summer is approximately equal to the amount of heat they extract in the winter. When we have an unbalanced cooling load, so here this is cooling dominant building, it ends up overheating the soil over time, which will decay the performance across decades. This is why we use a balanced cycle. But what I was wondering is, can we use this ground thermal imbalance, which is what it is called when this mean ground temperature um, changes, to combat the permafrost thawing? So here we can see the predicted ground temperature uh, warming up by climate change, which will eventually reach a thawing point. And I am showing here the application of a heating dominant load, which would intentionally overcool the soil and attempt to mitigate and keep that mean ground temperature constant. Without any intervention, there will be extreme um, economic and environmental costs to these communities. But with an intervention, there is potential that these piles could provide a beneficial ground thermal imbalance to locally maintain the permafrost as well as structural support and thermal energy. So this is my master's objective. First, to create a computational model of this pile, as it is a quite a new system and there's so uh, as yet no research performed on it in this capacity. Then I characterize the performance of this pile across many operating conditions and situations. And then finally investigated how well this pile would perform to provide that beneficial ground thermal imbalance in a permafrost soil. This research focus is divided into a couple chapters. The first one was spent developing a more detailed soil model uh, and creating a database of soil conductivity by depth with Leah Kober, my undergraduate research assistant who helped me with this. Then geometric optimization of the single pile was performed, so finding with nominal pipe sizes, the best thermal capacity. Uh, this was also done with assistance from Leah Kober. Then I measured the approximate peak capacity of the pile when used in operation with the building, as well as an annual performance across three building loads. And finally, I measured its performance in remote commun Canadian communities and in permafrost. This last two sections is what I'm focusing on in my presentation today. To perform this research, I used Comsol software, which allowed me to build a 3D computational model of a single helical pile. This software uses finite element analysis. Here is a top view of the model. Um, in order to solve fluid flow and heat transfer equations coupled um, at each intersection of the elements. In this way, I can solve for the heat transfer and fluid flow across all of my domains. So I have a domain of soil, fluid, plastic pipes, and a steel casing wall. The boundary conditions that I inlet, that I input to my model are shown here with the pile in the center. And to apply the, the climate change for the study on permafrost, I used a transient um, set of data here where the ambient air temperature increased linearly at a constant rate over 40 years by two degrees, which is that predicted value. This increase in ambient air temperature then affected the far field soil temperatures using a calculation of soil temperature by depth and time. This is also a transient input. The heating dominant load that I applied for this case was a constant minus five degrees Celsius at two liters a minute uh, flow rate. Then the soil uh, thermal conductivity that I used is calculated as a function of depth, and we divided uh, the regions of Canada into 11 zones based on their soil types and their climate. So in this way, from the surface of the ground here 
down below depth, we could calculate the approximate soil thermal conductivity as a variable value, which more closely approximates the reality of the soil, which is quite a complex domain. So we did this for dry soil, wet soil, and also ice soil. The focus of the permafrost studies are in region seven, which has a mean soil temperature close to zero, which might uh, thaw first uh, due to climate change. To validate this model, I recreated using COMSOL and the same boundary conditions. Um, this model here, pile one, from a study done in Saga City, Japan. This model then we ran a transient simulation and I validated for the outlet water temperature. So outlet water temperature over time. This is the model in the solid lines compared with their experimental collected data. It has quite good uh, agreement between the experimental and the computational model. Moving forward to my results of research, what I'm really focusing for this section is how much does the ground temperature change over 40 years when I ap apply the pile in the soil domain. So this is showing here an animation of the ground temperature changing across 40 years. I also want to know if usable thermal energy is extracted during this process. So here are two of my five cases which I simulated. The first one has no pile and it is in dry soil. So this is just a solid cylinder model of soil using the same boundary conditions that I described previously, except it does not have a helical steel pile within it and there is no thermal load applied. It is just being warmed by the ambient air temperature increase. We can see that the mean soil temperature, so here is an approximate permafrost region, starts at about minus four and it is warmed up here to about minus one. So that is quite a significant degree of warming. In comparison, this case has the optimized pile. So using that previous geometric study, we optimized the pile size and then performed it in the same soil conditions as this one. So in the first year, it starts around the same mean ground temperature, but after 40 years, there is some re reduction in the warming of the soil. You can see here a surrounding area which has been cooled by the piles application. Looking closer at the fluid, shown here as streamlines, where their color is reflected as a temperature here, we can see that the temperature of the water at the inlet here, which is minus five, is being warmed as it travels through the pile and back up the outlet here to about three and a half degrees. So this is the temperature difference which provides thermal energy. Looking closer, we can see at a depth of 10, degree, of 10 meters, in this model, if I slice a line through there and check the ground temperature, where zero is the center of the pile, I can see that without a pile, this temperature is initially between minus four and minus three degrees. But after 40 years, it is warmed up to almost minus one degree. With the application of the optimized pile, I do not have as much warming. So this area here is what has been saved by the pile's temperature difference. So here closest to the pile, it has not warmed up nearly as much. And even at distances of two meters away, this warming has been reduced. The ground stays cooler than it would without the application of the pile. Looking at this as a horizontal line beside the pile, we can see again, starting at zero, which is the ground surface going down below, this, down below the surface, the ground temperature here, and looking without any pile, this ground temperature, which is originally quite cold at the top due to the ambient air temperature in winter, and reaches down to its permafrost or mean soil temperature here, has been warmed up over time. So this area is now completely thawed, and this area is at great risk to thawing. When the pile is applied, however, this warming is significantly reduced, especially in the top layers, but also further down. So the application of the pile has prevented it from warming up along the length of the pile. Looking at this as four points at 15 meters depth, first starting the farthest away from the pile, the temperature here at this point over time, over the 40 years, 
starts at around minus three and increases by around two degrees because of climate change. This is also the case for the no pile um, uh, soil. Moving closer to the center of the pile here at point three, this temperature increase is slightly reduced. At point two, which is half a meter from the center of the pile, this temperature has been significantly reduced and this increase in temperature curve here is almost flattened. As well, this, this minus 2.8 degrees is nearly the, the initial temperature at that farthest point. And of course, right beside the pile, this warming due to climate change is almost negligible, especially in the dry soil condition. Now, the changes of climate change are likely not to be linear, and there are many different situations which we cannot predict in the future, including the one we're living through right now, which may affect how this ambient air temperature rise uh, is experienced by the soil. But if we were to assume that we can we can predict using this curve, this trend, into the future, we can start to see the approximate long-term effects that an application of a ground thermal imbalance uh, technology such as this might have. So in this slide, I'm projecting the same curve. Here, without a pile, I'm assuming that it would continue, and it will reach, at 15 meters depth, it will reach zero degrees Celsius, or the thawing point, at the year 2080. And then if we were to apply the pile at point two, which was half a meter away from the center in a radius, we can delay that thawing point by 50 to 75 years, which means that essentially in a local diameter of one meters, we can delay the effects of a temperature, a, a temperature influence such as climate change by 50 to 75 years, which is a significant, uh, a significant possibility and opportunity for these piles. Looking at how much thermal energy can be drawn during this process, here I am plotting the building heating load supplied. So in the negative value implies that the direction of heating is into the house. So the larger the negative value is, the larger the heating. This is across time here. And so it is an hourly output value. And it is using a COP of approximately 2.6. The ice soil conductivity has the, the greater ability to produce thermal energy because its soil conductivity is higher for the ice case than for the dry case due to the properties of solid water, which is the condition set for the ice. Um, but in both cases, as the warming was increased due to climate change over time, the ability to draw heat from the soil also increased. Essentially here we're using climate change uh, or the increase in an ambient air temperature as an energy source, as the thermal energy source for the heat pump. Using a peak value from this curve, we can predict the approximate number of piles that might be needed by a, by a building. So assuming that a building requires a one ton peak heating load, which is um, a, approximately a medium small size building heating load, uh, it would require 21 piles in dry soil and 8 piles in ice soil to meet that peak load. If we were to take an approximate spacing of 8 feet for these structural piles, a 1,000 square foot home might have 16 structural piles. And a slightly larger home might have 40 structural piles. So these 21 and 8 piles are certainly within reasonable values for this application. So in conclusion, the conductivity of the soil had a significant effect on its response to warming, where the higher conductivity soil did not, um, was not as benefited from the ground thermal imbalance, but it was able to extract more usable thermal energy over time. So this ice soils may warm quicker due to climate change, but we can also use them for greater thermal energy production. But for both cases, it was shown through this research that these helical steel piles are usable as the ground heat exchanger in these ground source heat pumps. They are able to deliver heating with only 8 to 21 piles required to meet a one ton peak heating load. And also, they can mitigate the local thawing of permafrost in these regions due to climate change. 
so around one meters of, of the soil, was delayed from thawing by 50 to 75 years. Right. I would like to thank Andrew and Jim at Anovia, as well as the IESO. I'd like to thank Leah from Ryerson University, the Dworkin Group at Ryerson, the Faculty of Engineering at Ryerson, also the CGS Scholarship from NSERC, and OCE. And I'd like to thank all of you for watching.